morning. morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. It's January 31st. For those of you watching on YouTube at a later time, for those of you watching from home on Zoom, we welcome you to our gathering as well. Although we gather in many different ways these days, we still all gather in one spirit to worship the one true God. Let's begin our worship this morning with a call to worship taken from Psalm 145. You'll find it in your bulletin as well as on the projected screen behind me. If you're following on Zoom, you can switch screens to, I believe it says Tom Nicholas, and his computer is pointed at the projection screen, so it should be easier for you to read. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, as we gather here this morning on the Lord's Day, may our worship lift high your name. May we think less of ourselves and more of you. May we decrease, may you increase. O oh Lord, we pray for your spirit to be active among us today, changing us, conforming us, transforming us into the image of your Son. O oh Lord, indeed, may this be a service of worship unto you. For you alone, Lord, are worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Not so. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Let's stand at this time and worship the Lord Jesus.
Be seated. Welcome again to RBC this morning. We're glad that you're here. We are especially glad when we have visitors come and join us today. So if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here as well. Uh, if, you, if you would like, if you don't mind, you can go on our website, effortrpc.com, and register there. It's just, just to say that you've been with us. Give us some contact information if you like. It's just a way for us to be in contact with you during the week. Also, you may have heard that we have a congregational meeting today. It will start about 10 minutes after the service. We're going to try to keep it fairly snappy so that we can get home before this blizzard comes or whatever it is that's coming. Uh, if you're visiting with us, you are more than welcome to come to the congregational meeting as well. You won't be allowed to vote, but you are certainly allowed to join us and uh, listen to all that God is doing in our church through the past year and what we're looking forward to in the coming year. I know we'll all miss the normal meal and fellowship that we uh, always have upstairs on the third floor during our meeting today. Uh, but our, our goal is to, uh, as Kevin said, to uh, get us uh, completed and finished so all can arrive home safely. Uh, would you pray with me now as I lead us uh, before our Father in heaven? Father, we come to you this morning. You are the one who is infinite, eternal, holy, holy, holy. The one who is full of grace and compassion. The one who is above all, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are invited to call you Father. We come as your creatures acknowledging that you purposely made us and that the span of years that we have on this planet right now are the very years that you intended for us. Let us walk in that confidence, even in the midst of times when we may be surrounded by doubt. Lord, that you would move towards us in our sin, the rebellion of our hearts, and give yourself to us as you have in Jesus, we simply marvel. And we marvel that we are your sons and your daughters. Lord, we confess our sins today, the things that we have done and the, the things we have left undone. Lord, forgive us for our self-deception, which is probably the hardest thing to see in our lives. Our old nature has an, an internal public relations department and it's rooted in pride. And Lord, we, we lack faith in the new identity that you've given to us and that our righteousness is found in you and in our union with you. May we walk in that. Father, we're thankful as a church uh, for your blessings to us, not just this past year, but for what uh, you have enabled this church to be and do since 1984 in the community of Ephrata. We're grateful for the missionaries uh, who have gone out from our church, given up much, and who faithfully proclaim your calling. We're grateful for the mercy ministry that continues to go on, not just from our deacons, for, but from others, um, with hearts for that as well. Father, keep us faithful to our calling. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering loss, who are grieving. We pray for those with heavy burdens. We ask for those who are distressed or anxious or depressed, overwhelmed. Lord, be with them through the storm. Pray that you'd be with the one who preaches your word now. Uh, give us ears to hear and grant to Kevin um, your spirit to bring to this church all those things that you intend for us to hear today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Colossians, chapter 2, as we continue our study in the book of Colossians. If you see on the screen behind me, as well as in the bulletin, uh, it's the same passage as last week, verses 16 through 23. Last week we focused on 16 through 19, this week we'll focus on 20 to 23, but also like last week I'm actually going to begin reading in verse 8, just as a lead up to our passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along starting in verse 8, otherwise you'll catch up to us, or we'll catch up to you at verse 16, starting in Colossians 2, 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross." He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And in verse 16 now, therefore that no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or in drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. And then our focus this morning, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referencing the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let me just begin by giving you the main point of the entire sermon. That way you can just pay attention for 30 seconds and then doze off for the rest of it or whatever you need to do. Here's the main point. If you have died with Christ, that is, if you have been baptized with Christ, if you are united with Christ, then do not submit to human traditions which have no power to stop the sinful flesh. If you have died with Christ, then do not submit, that's verse 20, to human traditions, it's verses 21 and 22, which have no power to stop the sinful flesh, verse 23. So now you can either take a nap or you can dig in a little deeper with me here. Verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Basically, if verses 9 through 15 are true. If it's true of you, everything he just said in 9 through 15. If it's true of you, that you've been filled in him. That you've been buried with him in baptism. You've been raised with him. That you were dead in your trespasses, but made alive together with him. If it's true that Christ has canceled the record of your debt that stood against you if it's true that he has triumphed over all rulers and authority, if that's true, if you have died with Christ, then why do you submit to regulations? Which are 
verse 22, according to human precepts and teachings. In other words, verse 8. Verse 8, see to it, no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So if 9 through 15 are true, and you've died with Christ, and you're in union with him, then why do you keep going back to verse 8? And submitting yourself, becoming captive again to these human traditions. If we could summarize verses 8 through 15, it would be simply, verse 8, don't be captive to human traditions. Don't do that. 9 through 15, it starts off with 4, because. Because of all these great truths about your baptism and your resurrection and Christ's triumph. And then in verse 20, it says, okay, if 9 through 15 are true, then don't do 8. As we said last week, don't go backwards. You've been freed from that. Don't go backwards. Now you notice that it's in the form of a question. There's a question mark at the end of verse 22. Although it's one of those questions that isn't really a question. It's a rhetorical question. Kind of like when your wife says, you're not wearing that, are you? Not really a question, is it? Paul's making a statement. Although it's in the form of a question. He's saying... Not if, but saying you have died with Christ. So therefore, don't put yourself under the submission of these regulations. Again, don't go backwards. You were born enslaved to sin. All of us were. Christians are people who have been freed from our sin by the blood of Christ. So don't go back into slavery. Now, it seems like kind of a silly thing to say. Like, well, of course. Why would you go back into slavery once you've been freed? Of course, you've been released from jail. Hey, can I just stay a few more days? No, of course we wouldn't do that. And yet, the human tendency in the human history proclaims that, yes, we we like to go back into slavery. Look at the book of Exodus. And the story there, God's people who lived through those days, they saw the plagues. I mean, they experienced the Passover. They walked through the Red Sea. They ate the manna. They saw the glory cloud descend on Sinai. If anyone should fully trust the Lord, you'd think it would be them. And yet, what do they do? Exodus 16, 2 and 3. The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They are ready to go back to Exodus. Why? Because they're hungry. They should know better. Numbers 11, verses 4 and 6, 4 through 6. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. They remember the cucumbers. And they've forgotten their slavery. And they said, let's go back. Because at least we had cucumbers. I don't know if that's code for something else, but I wouldn't go back for cucumbers. And I like cucumbers. Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land, that is the promised land, to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They are done with this. They are done with the Lord's plan. They don't even want to go to the promised land. It's kind of scary in the promised land. And we don't trust the Lord to provide. 
So we'd rather go back into slavery. And they're not just grumbling, they're actually making plans to do it. They're getting ready to choose a leader. Moses wants to take us there. Let's find someone who will take us back to Egypt. And what Paul is telling the Colossians is don't go back to Egypt. You dummies. I don't care how good the cucumbers taste. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't put yourself under these regulations that Christ has freed you from already. Back in Colossians 2, it says, Why, as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to regulations? The submit to regulations, the Greek word is dogmatizo. We get our word dogma from it. He uses it earlier in verse 14 where he says, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, the dogmas, the dogmas that enslaved you, that brought you into debt, the dogmas that Christ canceled and nailed to the cross, so that now you have no dogmas. You're not in debt any longer, so why go back and let yourself be dogmatized? Why do that? If Christ canceled your debt to a most holy God, whom you offended with every thought, word, and deed, why go right back into debt? What exactly are these regulations, these dogmas that he's talking about? Verses 21 and 22 give us a fuller picture of it. It says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. He's talking about outdated regulations that involve cleanliness codes, dietary laws, how to come to church, how to come to the temple what you have to look like and smell like and dress like. We talked about this last week. Those things have been abrogated when Christ came. They've been annulled. Christ has done away with those regulations. You don't need to follow them anymore. They were just a shadow. But Christ is the substance. That was all last week. And he's saying this week, he's saying, don't submit to these things. They perish as they are used. Think of food that they're supposed to eat or not eat. Even as you eat the food, it's, it's gone. It's done away with. It's a one-time thing. <laughs> you don't re-eat the same meal. It just emphasizes the temporary nature of the dietary laws. In the course of redemptive history, they were temporary. And once Christ has come, they're done away with. And all that's left now is just human precepts and teachings. It's just the traditions that they're hanging on to. But that have been done away with. And Paul is echoing in this verse here, he's echoing Isaiah. In Isaiah 29, 13. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. In other words, they say the right things, but it's all fake. Their hearts are far from me. It's all fake, and what they are doing is they are creating their own religion. Their fear of me is nothing but a commandment taught by men. It's not my word that they're obeying, it's their own. They create their own religion. It might sound Christian y, they use a lot of the biblical language. But it's not pleasing to the Lord. And there are many today who have left behind true religion, true biblical Christianity, because they've been deceived and lulled and lured by the philosophies of this world, man-made philosophies that promise so much but are empty and deceitful. It might be left-wing notions of sexuality. It might be right-wing notions of political power and nationalism. It could be anything in between. And people who get lulled and sucked into that lose everything. It's often cloaked in Christianese language. And we have to be very careful as we both speak and listen. 
as it's often cloaked under the guise of love or peace or unity or truth. But those words mean something very different than the biblical concepts. And they've created a new religion, folk religion, civic Christianity. It borrows from the Bible, but also infuses a lot of cultural ingredients into the mix. And what comes out is syncretism. It's putting two worldviews or religions or philosophies together and coming up with a whole new one. It's syncretism. It's one of the main warnings that the people of God received as they went into the promised land. He warned them repeatedly, don't mix that pagan religion that you're going to walk into with your own true religion. But they did it. And as the prophets will attest, much of what they were saying was, it sounded Jewish, it sounded biblical, but it included elements of pagan religions and the first and second commandments were broken. They still wanted God, they still wanted Yahweh, but they also sort of brought in some other gods. It's like saying, I still am devoted to my wife, but I'm also going to have a mistress on the side. The mistress of man-made religion, which is empty and deceitful. Jesus addresses this in Mark 7, starting in verse 5. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? You notice what they said. Why do they not walk according to the tradition of the elders? They didn't ask, why don't they follow the law of God? They asked, why don't they follow the traditions of men? And Jesus says, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, you're worried about traditions. And he applies Isaiah 29 to them. He says, your hearts are far from me. You've created your own religion. You've created some sort of syncretism. It's kind of Jewish, it's kind of the word of God, but it's also a whole bunch of other stuff a whole bunch of other cultural traditions that you've sort of mixed together. And in verse 8 of Mark 7, Jesus gives his final analysis and summary. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. By trying to mix this with anything else, you're basically saying, I don't need this, I'd rather have something else. As if this isn't enough. And Jesus says, you've just left it behind. He's not antinomian, which means he's against the law, like, oh, you don't have to do the law anymore. It's just all grace. No, 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 he doesn't say that. He says you left behind the commandments of God. He's worried about them leaving behind the commandments of God and elevating the tradition of men. He's not antinomian, he's anti-worthless traditions. So what are some of the human precepts or dogmas that we are prone to today? Because we know... This wasn't a problem just in the first century. In Paul's day, it had to do with regulations involving dietary laws and cleanliness codes. In our day, perhaps, in the church sphere of things, some traditions that we have elevated to near law. Think about the worship wars, musical preferences. It's one thing to have a preference, that's fine. It's another to say, this is the only way to rightly worship God. I remember having a conversation with someone in the back of the room there who was visiting. Saw the drum set. You can't worship God with the drum set. Sorry, Ben. It wasn't just, I don't prefer that. It was like, it can't be done. It was cultural baggage that was getting mixed in. In our denomination, we tend to be pretty cerebral. We tend to think that, well, if you're a true Christian, then you know a certain amount. And the more you know, the more holy you are. You can trust my wife on this one. I have a master of divinity, and she can tell you just how holy I am. Actually, don't ask her, though. 
That's why I had her stay home today. But we tend to elevate knowing, knowledge, strict guidelines for a devotional life. If you're a true Christian, your devotional life will look like this. You'll pray this much. You'll tithe this much. You'll read your Bible this much. Specific traditions regarding what programs the church is to have, on what days of the week it's supposed to have them, at what time they're supposed to have them. Sabbath regulations. What are we supposed to do on Sundays? Are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to do that? I remember in a previous church, the youth group would meet right after church. And most of the kids would run down the block to a deli and get a sandwich, come back, we'd have lunch during youth group. And a couple families didn't do that. You don't, you don't buy from a store on Sunday. It was fine. It was their way of honoring the Lord. They didn't make it a rule for us. We didn't make it a rule. You know, it was fine. But sometimes we're tempted to kind of make that like a law. I was talking to a friend this past week about the Sabbath, and I, what it comes down to is that our hearts want rules. Just give me the rules. Tell me what I can and can't do. Because it's easier to just sort of follow the rules and check the boxes. And what often happens, like with the Pharisees, is that once we can check the boxes and quantify sort of our goodness or our holiness or our maturity, then we can either beat ourselves up over it or we can boast. We're saved from one set of human laws and Christ frees us from that. And sometimes we jump right into a whole other set of laws with maybe a Christian veneer over the top. These aren't gospel things. They're not necessarily bad things either, but they're not the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And at the end of the verse, against such things there is no law. It's harder to measure if we're growing in the fruit of the Spirit than it is to measure how many days this week I read my Bible. So it's easier to sort of fall into just this, give me some rules, give me some laws, and become enslaved to those, rather than growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Romans 12, 2, Paul tells us, Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do you grow? It's by transformation, the renewal of your mind. Don't be conformed. In other words, quite literally, don't have the form of, don't be with the form of the world. The world has a certain form to it. He says, no, be transformed, change forms from the form of the world to the form of Christ. Borrow an illustration from Dr. Phil Smealand, who was a, my pastor when I was in college, and Eric Knoll's pastor, too. He used the illustration of, this is you conformed to the world. The glass vase is the world. It has a certain form, a certain size, a shape, certain contours. And you, when you're in the world, you're that wire in there, all twisted and gnarled conform to the world. You hold to its values. You hold to its traditions. You hold to its notion of what entails the good life. I read a poll recently that was done in the U.S. and all across Europe, and they asked, what is more important, personal freedom or helping others? And in Europe... Most of the countries in Europe was about two to one that helping others was more important. In the U.S., it was personal freedom, two to one. Now, I ask you, what would the Bible say about that? How many verses can you find that talk about helping others in the Bible? And how many can you find about your personal freedom and your autonomy and your rights? 
We are so deeply entwined in our culture. And we don't even realize it. And we mix in, we pour in Christian stuff. We sort of create this synchristic religion. But what Christ does, when he comes to us, And he saves us. And he takes the form of the world. And what does he do? He overcomes the world. And what does he do with all those elemental spirits? He triumphs over them. To free us from that mold. And he nails it to the cross. And he breaks us. And he shatters it. He shatters that mold. So we are no longer confined to the form of the world. Now when that happens, we don't come out straight. We're still just as crooked and gnarled and bent as we ever were. But God's not done with us yet. You see, now that we're out of the mold, now he can really get to work on us. It's a Bible verse that says God's word is a hammer. And he comes to us, and he has to start straightening us out and getting us back into the shape we're supposed to be, nice and straight, and he works on us. And he pounds it into us. And he tries to get us straight. He says, no, 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 no. It's not about your rights. It's about service. You're not independent. You're dependent on a community of believers. There's not more than two genders. God created a male and female. And he works on us. And he hammers us. And he sanctifies us. He says, life isn't about your happiness. It's about losing your life for my sake. But as soon as we lay aside the word of God, what is our tendency? go right back into that same form. Even though we're no longer bound by it. Even though it's been shattered. Our tendency is to go right back into the form of the world. We sing the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We tend to want to wander back to Egypt. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't be conformed. Don't be dogmatized. Don't go back to Egypt. In verse 17, he says, don't do it because it's just a shadow that you're chasing. It's not the true form, not the true substance. And in verse 23, he says, don't do it because this is is just man-made has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All of these regulations, all these laws, all these traditions we come up with is no value in stopping our desire to sin. No, we need God to hammer us out. All of these other things just promote legalism. There's three aspects to legalism. One, taking outdated instructions and trying to apply them. All of these instructions about cleanliness codes and dietary laws, they're outdated. It's anachronistic to try to apply them today. They were meant for another time. It's like if you ask me, hey, do you have the contact information for so-and-so? And I said, oh, sure, yeah, I'll just fax it over to you. You would be like, why don't you just text it to me? <laughs> Why do that? Number two, legalism focuses on external goodness instead of internal goodness. You could say human traditions rather than on the fruit of the Spirit. And number three, legalism bases one's righteousness and sanctification on arbitrarily determined laws rather than the finished work of Christ. 
The cry of the legalist is, I'm glad I'm not like them. I checked the boxes. I kept the rules. Luke 18, Jesus tells this story. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I check the boxes. The Pharisee is a legalist. It's the tax collector. That's this twist in the story. It's the tax collector that understands holiness. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Holiness, obedience, true discipline, love's mercy. Holiness understands our creatureliness in the light of the Creator. Holiness has gratitude for Christ, seeks to please Christ, seeks to honor Christ. The cry of the Holy One says, I wish I was more like you, O Lord. It's the psalmist who says, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of my mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The Holy One tries to obey the commandments of God, not so he can say, I'm glad I'm not like other people, because I checked the boxes. But it's with gratitude and love for Christ. So how do you know if the disciplines you're trying to keep have crept from a pure desire to be holy into legalism? Here's one easy diagnostic question for you. To whom does your rule following bring glory? To whom does your rule following bring glory? To you or to Jesus? Does your rule following say, look at me. Look at all I've done. Look how much I've tithed. Look how much I read the Bible. Look how good I am. Or does your rule following say, look at him. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus tells us, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and say, my, my, what a nice Christian they are. No, it says, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That sort of rule following brings glory to God. That's holiness. That's obedience. That sort of holiness and obedience cries out, look at him. He is my all in all. He is the one who created me who loved me, who died for me, who forgave me, who redeemed me, who cleansed me, and who brings me to glory. Look at him. Paul says, pursue that holiness. Not these worthless human traditions. And don't ever, ever go back to Egypt. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, we want to give you thanks for all that you have done for us. The list in 9 through 15 is immeasurable. We've been filled in him. We've been buried in him. We've been resurrected in him. We've been made alive together with him. You've triumphed over our adversaries. You've triumphed over our enemies. You've nailed our debt to the cross and said it is paid in full. Oh Lord, let us rejoice 
Let us rejoice in you, take delight in you, seek to please you, seek to honor you and not ourselves. Oh Lord, convict us, help us to understand where our desire for holiness has crept into just a desire for legalistic obedience to be self-satisfied rather than to be satisfied in Christ. Oh Lord, help us. Search our hearts. Help us to take good stock of ourselves. Oh Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Extend your hands, if you would, to receive God's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements as we uh, conclude our service. Uh, Courtney is seeking to gather uh, people for a virtual choir for Easter. I know that's hard for you to think about in January, but next week we're in February, and next week we're only about eight or nine weeks away from Easter, so it's not that far away. Um, so for those who would like to join in on that, whether you are uh, had done that previously or not, uh, that invitation uh, is extended to you. Um, our congregational meeting uh, follows this. Uh, we, it's just about 10.30, and I'd like to begin the meeting at 20 of. So that would be a, about a 10-minute break for us to just say hi, hit the restrooms, and then kind of regather for the congregational meeting. As Kevin mentioned, if you're not a member of the church, you're welcome to attend. Uh, see what uh, kind of things are covered in a... Uh, Presbyterian congregational meeting. Uh, you, you're invited to be our guests uh, for that. Uh, congratulations. We have a, a new birth. I don't like to say these things uh, online, but we have a new birth for, I'll just say the first names for Alex and Becky. Can you guys raise your hands? And it's a Aaliyah? Okay. First worship service for Aaliyah. Um, Welcome, and we rejoice with you. There is a meal sign-up that's listed uh, in the bulletin if you'd like to uh, support them uh, uh, during this time of going from three in the family to four in the family. Blessings on you. Uh, so at this time, you're dismissed, and we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.